right. Good morning. Good morning. Brad, thank you so much for sitting with us today. We're going to have a great chat. Well, thanks. Thanks. It's great to be here with all of you. It's great to be here with you. We are talking about AI today. It's not the first time AI has been a buzzword, even at this conference in general, but I'm excited to get your thoughts on this as president of Microsoft and, and talk about the opportunities as well as some of the risks. So let's, let's dive right in. Okay. Let's start with how we define AI a little bit because it's, it's a buzzword that encompasses everything from machine learning to algorithmic decision making. What do you think, how important is the definition of this when we're talking about it broadly speaking? I think some clarity always helps whenever you're having a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I do think you just hit the nail on the head of one of the big challenges. AI is so broad, it's becoming a topic almost as broad as computing itself. Uh, but fundamentally, I think what artificial intelligence refers to is the ability of computers to perceive and understand what's happening in the world, to then understand uh, what is happening, and to make decisions themselves. Uh, it is those components that we're now seeing computers able to do in a way that people have long been imagining, really since the 1950s and even earlier, uh, but it is rapidly becoming part of the fabric of technology. How much is AI already part of our lives that maybe we don't even notice? And then how much more opportunity is there from here? Well, I think that it is part of our lives already mm -hmm. and the opportunity is much vaster than we have today. Um, but it is amazing because you know, ultimately what your question points to is AI is not just one big thing, it's many slices. So if you use Spotify or if you use Netflix, uh, you are benefiting from AI because machine learning is telling you that based on the song you last listened to or the movie you'd last watched, what a computer thinks you would like to watch next. Uh, if you think about something like vision recognition, uh, you know, if there are so many automobiles today that are not self-driving cars, but they'll have an alert that will go off if, if the car perceives that through a camera that there is a pedestrian walking into the street. Uh, if you have an iPhone, you, you might use the Steno app, and the Steno app not only records uh, a conversation, but it is using you know, speech recognition to transcribe it. Um, so in all of these things, you see the various pieces being used, and to some degree, we would probably benefit from recognizing those pieces already. And is that a benefit both to the companies and to the individuals? And from a, your perspective at Microsoft, how are you ensuring that this AI development is going to help the people who it's ultimately serving? Well, I think that there's a few things to think about. The first thing is, look, in any product, in any business, if it's not benefiting the company that's creating it and the customers that are using it, it's going to have a very short life. So that's just sort of a given. Um, now, in, in this context, um, when I think about our role at Microsoft as a company, I think our mission is clear. It is to, to democratize AI. You know, we are not trying to be the company that says, give us your data and we will give you the answer to your questions. You know, we are the company that is trying to say we will create the platform capabilities, we will create the tools, we will create not just dozens, but now into the hundreds of APIs, and we will therefore even give you the skills so you can go create the AI systems and services for your business and your government and your nonprofit so they can be more successful. And of course, part of this should be about helping businesses become more productive in new ways. But of course, one of the really exciting things is to think about it differently. Let's look at the big human challenges of the day, climate change, accessibility, human rights, you know, disaster relief. Let's start with the problem and then go back and ask how can AI be a new tool to solve this problem in a more effective way. And does a company like Microsoft have a role in those big issues, climate change, when it comes to its technology, particularly AI? Absolutely. I mean, one of the part of the company that I'm responsible for has launched three programs. Last year, it was AI for Earth. We followed it with AI for accessibility. And then we followed it with AI for humanitarian action. And I think there'll be more. There's a couple of new ones we're incubating. Uh, and, you know, collectively, uh, we, you know, we've committed 
well over $100 million over the next five years to these areas. And fundamentally, what we're trying to do is partner with others, nonprofits, academics and universities, and startups. And then what we do is we provide cash for investments, we provide technology, but a lot of what we then provide is expertise. And I think that's probably what is most exciting. If you take our AI for Earth team, I think it's the only team in any tech company that has both computer scientists and data scientists and environmental scientists. And then we work with, say, nonprofits who are great experts in, say, a, a, a substantive aspect you know, relating to you know, water or, or agriculture uh, or to climate, and we figure out how can we use AI to help them do what they're doing better. That's a little bit different mentality, the democracy of AI, than some of the companies that are out there, big tech names, who are harvesting this data. We don't really know what they're doing with it. How do you compete with those companies, and, and do you have a message for those, not to be named, other tech giants? Well, look, everybody has their business model, and that's good. I mean, I think if we all had the same business model and there were only one business model, you know, the, the world would be a less interesting place. Um, and so, you know, if other companies want to compete by basically saying, we will be the great data aggregators and we'll monetize the data, but we'll in some ways, you know, compensate you, um, maybe it's through a free service or maybe it's through something else, you know, th that, that's fine. I have no complaints. I do think, there, though, there is a broad economical, economic and even uh, societal issue for the world. If you just think about the products, think about something like an automobile. Think about an automobile in the year 2040. I think a significant percentage of the value of that automobile is going to be in the computers and AI systems and data and ability to use the data. So who's going to get the economic value of that piece? Is it going to be a tech company on the west coast of the United States or China? Or is it going to be an automobile company in Germany or France or somewhere else? Um, we're pretty heavily invested in this notion that the world's a better place when all of these businesses and all of these industries and all of these countries can continue to grow and reap the economic benefits of this kind of innovation, we'll do just fine. If we're providing the platforms and tools, we'll do well, but let's do well in a way that actually says, let's ensure that they do even better by using these tools in these new ways. Let's talk about some of the economic side effects of that then. If, if every company is essentially a tech company, what does that do for the jobs? And of course, one of the big concerns we hear about AI is, you know, robots going to take your job, automation is replacing everything. This is a terrible doomsday scenario. Is there another side to this that we're maybe missing? Well, I think there's multiple sides, but I actually think we need to acknowledge all of them and address them together. If you're from a tech company, it's almost expected you're going to start with the, the bright, sunny side of things. So I'll do that for a second. Look, AI is going to enable people to do new things. It's going to you know, drive productivity. It should drive economic growth writ large. But then you get this question of, yes, but are the benefits distributed in some kind of broad way, in any way that people would regard as sort of equitable or beneficial? And the truth is there's always winners and losers. There are winners and losers from trade, and there's winners and losers from technology. One of the things we really have to think about is, what do we do for the people whose jobs are gonna be at risk? Uh, and I think one of the big things we need to do, of many, is ensure that we're equipping the, today's workforce, tomorrow's workforce, with the skills so they can succeed. Part of this involves predicting what skills will be needed. Some are relatively easy. Data, the ability to work with data, the ability to work with computers, that is a valuable skill. The interesting thing, I believe, the part that has been overlooked is as we take computers into an era where we're asking machines to make decisions that previously were always made by people, the humanities become more important. Social sciences become important. Every day I'm struck, whether it's at Microsoft or the other tech companies, my gosh, we need engineers, we need data scientists who understand other parts of the liberal arts. We need people who come from the other parts of the liberal arts who know how to work and interact with people who have expertise in, in data and computer science. I think that a decade from now, 
we're going to see more jobs in tech companies. We're going to see more jobs working with technology in every company that actually calls on these other disciplines because they all need to be integrated together. So a data scientist might also need to have a liberal arts background. I think that every person who, say, goes to a university and majors in data science or computer science would be very well served to take more courses in the liberal arts than, say, those students did a decade ago. And by the same token, any student who is a history major, a political science major, yeah, and another liberal arts major, it's like, please take a computer science course, take a, a, a mathematics, a data course, take a statistics course, get some grounding in that as well. This lends itself nicely to the conversation around ethics then, because when we're talking about AI, you, there are concerns that if a human is programming an algorithm and there's bias programmed into that, that has a whole range of implications that we can't even predict. So how do you monitor that and how do you prevent that from happening from an ethical perspective? Well, I think you have to start at the beginning and the beginning is to say that as computers make decisions that previously were made by people, every ethical issue in the history of humanity is now an ethical issue for computers. And that is a big concept to begin to focus on. You then, of course, break it into pieces. Uh, what we did earlier this year was take a first step and said, look, at least as far as we can discern, there's really six ethical issues that people need to think about. There, there's uh, bias, there's privacy and security, reliability and safety, there's accessibility, and there's these two foundational concepts on which all the others rely. One is the need for transparency, and the other is the need for accountability. And then you start to dive deeper. What are the issues? How do we address them? How do we train people to address them? And you have to do it with the recognition that this is a global conversation because ethics ultimately are founded in, to a degree on philosophy, moral philosophy. There's important traditions around the world. And you need to recognize that in a way, look, this is a quest for the rest of our lives. This is not a set of questions that is gonna be answered in a year. Is there a recognition universally, at least among tech companies, that there needs to be some sort of guideline around the eth guidelines around the ethics here? Or are you sort of saying, we need to start even thinking about this? Have, is this even not on the radar quite yet? I think both things are true. But I think if you uh, just look back at the year 2018, there is a saying in tech that has gone from being what some companies put on their walls as their mantra, their call to their employees, where I suspect they're going in and taking paint and, and putting it over. It was called move fast and break things. This is too important to run around breaking things. And when I think about something like AI, I mean, what we're seeing is certain issues emerge at the forefront. I think that's good because you can't solve all these problems at once. You gotta start dividing it up into slices. I think facial recognition is one of the most fundamental issues for AI, and, and maybe, maybe the first one we'll have to work through. And you know, our view is it needs law, it needs regulation. We need to ensure that this technology uh, is, is governed in a way that societies are comfortable. And just take a, a, a straightforward proposition. We are rapidly creating a world where it is technically possible for the government, the state, to follow around a specific person, you. They can follow you in real time using facial recognition and know everywhere you go, know anywhere you go, know anything you buy, know anybody you talk to. Is that a world we want to create? So before we run around and break even more things, let's stop and have a conversation and ask what kind of world do we want to create? Because if we just rush forward and create this world, and then we realize a decade from now that we're uncomfortable, it is a whole lot more difficult to unwind things. One thing that I find interesting speaking with you is that the idea that tech is taking the leading role in bringing this to attention, that we need to start developing some regulations around this. Is this a sea of change where it's no longer government you know, has, have, have they fallen behind and are they listening? And, and is the regulation in sight, particularly in the U.S.? Well, I, I, you know, th there's a wide variety of views in the tech sector. Uh, and 
yeah, I think we're to some degree maybe even a little bit of an outlier ourselves. I think because we went through these experiences 20 years ago, uh, when we were you know, in the, the crosshairs of antitrust issues, you know, we became comfortable with this before others did. Uh, and yeah, I think that you know, our view is, look, no individual should be above the law. You know, no company, no technology should be above the law. So let's embrace that and now let's start to talk about what that future law should look like. And you know, we'll probably be in the earlier of some companies to say, hey, we have some ideas and we'll do it with the recognition that we don't get to decide, but at least we'll share our ideas. Other companies will say, no, we don't want law. We don't want government. Government doesn't get it. It moves too slow. And there'll be lots of big companies that frankly won't make up their minds because it's hard to make up your mind on these tough questions. Um, but it is different. I definitely think you see across the tech sector an awakening that this old notion of just, you know, say, this is where the government should be and, you know, just applaud us when we do great things. That world is over. That era is over. I actually think the newer era is going to be a better one in terms of addressing these societal issues. But it takes some strong leadership and potentially even higher executive leadership who are aware of these the divergence between ethics and the technology of the company itself. Is there going to be a whole new set of leaders coming out saying, this is the stance my company is taking, this is where we need to stand on, on ethics? I, I, I hope so. I mean, this is actually a really interesting and important week, this week and next. Because you've got the, you know, the Web Summit at Lisbon this week, and you have the Paris Peace Forum and other meetings in Paris next week. And one of the things that people will see in Paris is leaders from government and civil society and the tech sector all there. Uh, and you know, it, there will be a renewed effort around cybersecurity and what people are calling digital peace. And uh, yeah, I think it's an opportunity for us to come together to address some of these issues, to put our shoulder behind things like protecting you know, civilians on the internet from cyber attacks and the like. And I think that is one example. And the more we can start to do this on some issues, the more we can do it on other issues and ultimately with the recognition that fundamentally what we're talking about is a set of changes that is gonna affect so many areas of public policy, of law, uh, of the real issues of our time. Brad Smith, thank you so much for sitting down with us. Sounds like you've got some great ideas that are going to, we're going to be hearing about, not just today in the next few weeks, a long time to come. Thank you, thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much.